Good day to all our listeners. I'm Patrick Clausen. I'm the Director of Research and the Director of the Viterbi Program on Iran here at the Washington Institute for Near East Policy. Thank you for joining us today for what promises to be a lively discussion uh, about the question of how does Tehran view Washington? And to uh, address that issue, we have two excellent uh, panelists. First, we're going to have uh, Amir Tumaj, who is an independent Iran researcher and is co-founder of the Resistance Access Monitor. Um, and he is the author of a study that you can find on the Washington Institute website uh, on the subject um, of Iranian perceptions of the US soft power threat, uh, which discusses how Iran views the what it sees uh, as the threat of uh, the United States promoting regime change uh, in Iran. And then commenting is going to be Sanam Vakil. She's the deputy director of the Middle East and North Africa program at Chatham House in London, uh, where she works, uh, leads the project work on Iran and the Arab Gulf uh, countries. Um, she has her PhD from, from Johns Hopkins University. Before we get started, let me remind you that we welcome questions from the audience. If you're watching this uh, on Zoom, you can go to the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen and type in your question. And if you're watching this on other media, live stream and so on, um, you can send us a question at policyforum at washingtoninstitute.org. So that's policyforum at washingtoninstitute.org. So send in your questions anytime, and, and uh, then uh, I will read them and post them to our two presenters uh, after we hear from each of them. So with that, let me just turn things over to Amir. Thank you so much, Patrick, and for the opportunity for the presentation today. I'm going to give a 10 minute short brief of the paper and the policy lessons that we can learn from that. Today, as uh, Patrick mentioned, the Islamic Republics, especially its uh, centers of power, namely the Supreme Leader and the Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps, believe that they're fighting a US-led software designed to overthrow the Islamic Republic from within through a series of perceived measures that include sanctions, but also cultural products. These could, these would encompass music, movies, social media, fashion trend, et cetera, that would change Iranians' value to be at odds with the religious traditional values promoted by the state, thereby leading to agitation and towards regime change. In this view, software targets popular support of the state, which the Islamic Republic has long believed to be the pillar of its support. Another form of soft war uh, could be the strengthening of moderates within, of perceived moderates within the Islamic Republic who favor better ties with the US or want to tone down some ideological principles for improved ties with the world. Last week, for example, the IOGC political deputy uh, stated that the US still seeks to extract concessions through the nuclear negotiations that it no longer uh, wants to exercise quote unquote hard power, which would be military action because it lacks the will and because of, of uh, previous defeats in the Middle East and that the US still wants to undermine the Islamic Republic through soft war. And this is something that we'll see uh, in, the, in, the, in the briefing, this baseline that the U.S. wants to promote regime change remains constant throughout various administrations, even as it uh, sometimes can, death threat perception can increase or can decrease, but the baseline remains. The roots of the Islamic Republic's hostility toward the U.S. isn't solely the result of American policies in Iran and the Middle East in the past century, those certainly can't be ignored. But if policies were the only reason for the roots of this hostility, we could ex expect similar hostility toward Russia, which in the past 
uh, 200 years, has annexed Persian territory during the Russo-Persian Wars in the early 19th century. Russia occupied Iran uh, in, the, in the early 20th century and intervened in Iranian politics to a bad degree, even after the uh, post-World War II period, it had ambitions to annex uh, some parts of Iranian territory and continue through the modern era, Russia invaded Afghanistan where it, scored, where it killed scores of Muslims uh, in the Chechen wars, that was the same case as well. But we, But the key difference between Russia and the US as far as Iranian leaders perceive is that they don't perceive a threat of cultural invasion from Russia. And this concern about Western cultural invasion, uh, there's a long current in Iran that goes back to a century, believing that, the, that Western modernism, Western secularism erodes the indigenous culture and makes it subservient to the West. And that particular concern, the, reflect some unresolved issues in Iranian society that go back uh, toward late 19th century. It really started to pick up in the early 20th century, but to get to that, you can see that in the paper, how it goes to that, but it's outside the scope of this particular briefing now. Concerned about Western cultural invasion start to gain traction among opposition groups to the Pahlavi monarchy and took on an anti-American hue following the, the uh, 1953 coup and, the, and, and also continued US support to the Pahlavi monarchy. After 1979, Ayatollah Ruhollah Khomeini, who was the founder of the Islamic Republic and his successor, uh, Ayatollah Ali Khamenei, have expressed deep concern and an obsession to purify Iranian culture of so-called negative Western influence and fight American cultural invasion through state intervention in media, education, or public morality laws. Khomeini launched a uh, cultural revolution in the early 80s that was not so successful in terms of measuring that this cultural revolution succeeded in uh, changing the values of most Iranian people at large uh, to be in line with the values that the state wants. Uh, some other thing that the Islamic Republic officials close, look really close at and how this factors in into their, percept, their threat perception of the US is the lessons they learned about the Soviet collapse in uh, 1991. And in 2000, the Supreme Leader Ali Khamenei, he discussed in depth about uh, the way he saw uh, the collapse of the Soviet Union was caused by the US uh, seducing and encouraging uh, f uh, figures like Gorbachev, who in, uh, in a short way to say this, that they lost the will to fight for the ideology. And instead of fighting protests that came to the street, Gorbachev, he decided to dissolve the Soviet Union. And the way that Khamenei uh, looks at reformists inside Iran, looks at perceived moderates inside Iran, uh, is in a large, is in a significant part influenced and informed by that lesson of how he saw the Soviet collapse. So when he had a statement in the 2000s, speech that he said, uh, Mr. Khatami, who was uh, President Mohammad Khatami at the time, the reformist president, that he is not a Gorbachev. And that at the time referred to uh, Western comparisons of Khatami to, to, to Gorbachev, who would open up Iran internally and to the world. It's crucial to note that the idea of soft war expanded following the 2009 post-election protests and when President Obama was trying to reach out to the Islamic Republic for better ties and to reach a nuclear deal. That theme stayed, that theme remained through the Trump era, even though the threat, perce the threat perception of regime change increased. 
Uh, and we also see that a year into the Biden administration that hasn't made particular remarks about regime change, that this threat perception is also extends today. Uh, there are several policy lessons that we can learn from this. Over the past several decades, American, there's been a tendency among, some tendency among American policymakers to, to feel that they have to address the perceived roots of hostility with the Islamic Republic in order to strike major bargains or even to restart ties. While that could be true to an extent and US policymakers can influence uh, perception through public statements about regime change, that can only go so far because American policymakers can't alter the threat perception of an American cultural invasion. And policymakers should assume and accept that they can't change the Islamic Republic's mind on that. At the same time, this doesn't mean that the United States can't reach a deal with the Islamic Republic. For example, uh, Supreme Leader Ali Khamenei, he remained in the Iran nuclear deal known as the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action, even though after 2015, he really expanded the idea that America was trying to undermine him in the long run by so-called infiltration, which he referred to as the US trying to strengthen uh, pro-Western figures or figures who want to uh, downplay or turn down ideology in the long run. Uh, some folks may ponder whether the regime actually believes the software propaganda and one lesson learned is to look at the QAnon experience in the United States and how difficult it is to change worldviews and perceptions. What is certain is that the Islamic Republic relies on the notion of soft war to maintain solidarity of its support base. And that can be looked at a way to minimize defections in the military and security forces. And there has been a series of defections or people turning away. Even we had our former IRGC commander, uh, Jeff, a, discussing that after 2009, uh, election protest, they, uh, they faced IRGC officers and rank and file who sympathize with protest and they in turn try to focus on more ideological, um, uh, more ideological figure to try to root that out. And we've sort of seen that to an extent in the 2017, 2018 protest, there was a social media trend of uh, Basij paramilitary members, which is a paramilitary organization that falls under the command of the IRGC, uh, burning their membership cards. But those membership cards were sort of not the quote unquote special members who received military training from the IRGC ground forces. Uh, those were sort of uh, not the hardcore ideological figures. The regime support base has shrunk significantly over time and has accelerated in recent years. And we've seen in uh, mass protests uh, in the 2017, 2018 nationwide protests uh, from the November 2019 one. And even today uh, that is ongoing in Isfahan that protests broke out in areas that were long considered to be traditional support places of the Islamic Republic and those encompass working class uh, cities, small working class towns. And there was a very striking image out of the Esfahan protest of a lady who was wearing a uh, conservative chador uh, garment uh, that is associated with conservative and traditional members of society pelting security forces on order cycles. So that shows how much of Iranian society uh, are turning away from the state and turning their backs on it. Uh, we can see software as a means to essentially keep fighting forces on the street and fight to the death for the lack of a better word because this mindset essentially uh, tells folks that they are that they are in a siege, that the war is within 
Iran itself and a lot of what they see as the Iranian population uh, turning their backs on the state, uh, not valuing the traditional religious values of the state are in fact caused as a result of this American cultural invasion. And the implications of this is that we probably won't see a repetition uh, like we saw when the Pahlavi monarchy under Reza Shahi abdicated the throne in 1979 instead of preferring to remain and to fight or like Obarak and Egypt stepping down. Meanwhile, the state is incapable or unwilling to address public grievances and has resisted reform, which means that we can expect more protests uh, that will get more, probably will get more violent and we can even see a revolution on the horizon. The likeliest scenario is protracted unrest, even possibly civil war. It's worth noting that the state was able to discourage uh, some opponents or gain some level of legitimacy by uh, implicitly warning that Iran would become another Syria. So this is a scenario like someone threatening to light a match after pouring gasoline. Uh, policymakers should assume that regime change probably isn't going to happen anytime soon. It takes immense sustained force to uh, make that happen. And those historically have taken the form of foreign invasion that toppled Nazi Germany or Imperial Japan, or recently in Afghanistan and Iraq. And that sort of scenario won't be happening uh, at least anytime soon, or actually for a long period of time. And for US policymakers, should they support internal elements that want to do regime change, that sort of a course of action has its own myriad issues and pitfalls. Therefore, Washington should assume that a hostile rogue regime is here to stay for the foreseeable future. And that, and the consequences that, that we can see as far as the region is concerned, uh, we saw the, over this year, the breakup of the Gaza war that was the Islamic Republic, uh, uh, sort of getting back at Israel over its uh, undermining and sabotage in recent period of time, or we can even see uh, potentially a uh, absolutely destructive third war in Lebanon. At the same time, we the American public has shown little appetite for continued presence in the Middle East, and they voted for candidates who have pledged to withdraw or to reduce footprint for several election cycles now. There's a range of options available that can advance US national security interests, such as continuing uh, the Abraham Accord Initiative or something similar to that, while uh, cutting deals with the Islamic Republic when necessary. But I think that would be the, I know this is a bleak assessment and the way that I, see this uh, as long as the trends that I mentioned hold that this is the particular path that we are going to be head to, heading to. <clears throat> well, thank you, Amir. Uh, Sanam, if we could turn to you for your comments, please. Thank you, Patrick, and uh, nice to be here. And I'm happy to comment um, on Amir's interesting uh, paper and I think very relevant, uh, perhaps, um, it would have been very useful had it been released during the Trump administration period because many of these findings might have uh, better informed U.S. policymakers who uh, were uh, mistakenly assuming that maximum pressure might indeed uh, lead to uh, some sort of uh, internal shifts, uh, if not hoping for some bigger um, outcome in Iran. Um, I do hope uh, that a number of years on, perhaps uh, American policymakers are a bit more wiser um, in, in their approach towards the Islamic Republic, but nevertheless, this is an important issue uh, that requires unpacking. And I very much agree with um, many of uh, the findings uh, that Amir presents in his paper about the soft war, the Janganam, which is um, a huge, uh, a topic uh, within uh, the uh, conservative uh, establishment uh, within Iran, as he laid it out. It's not a new concept by any means, and it has its roots uh, going back a number of generations. But I think pointing to 
the Pahlavi period and, and the ideas of West toxification uh, really uh, sort of bring up um, this uh, deeper concern about fear of foreign influence, which of course we can also link to uh, other countries in the region and sort of the historical experience of uh, external actors in the Middle East more broadly, but of course in Iran uh, more specifically. Um, and uh, Amir, I think, was very right uh, to hone in, particularly on the issue of the downfall of the Soviet Union as being a huge uh, key um, moment, a turning point, if you will, for uh, a number of Iran's uh, leadership, particularly uh, Ali Khamenei, Iran's supreme leader, um, that has a particular um, obsession, if you will, on um, the, the downfall of the Soviet Union, its causes, uh, having uh, tried to sort of uh, take the lessons of uh, the Soviet Union's uh, economic opening and cultural opening and uh, trying to apply those lessons to protect the Islamic Republic uh, more broadly. Um, the color revolutions that were also witnessed um, throughout uh, Eastern Europe and, and the Caucasus, for example, have also influenced uh, this, this sort of paranoia, uh, coupled with, of course, the longstanding tensions and enmity uh, with the United States, which are, of course, the primary drivers of um, his uh, uh, anti-Americanism, if you will, and a fear of uh, a soft war um, and, and how uh, uh, cultural influence from abroad um, can change Iran from within. Um, I frankly don't think that um, uh, Ali Khamenei uh, is wrong to be paranoid of a soft war and, and how it can change Iran because Iranian, um, the Iranian uh, middle class in particular has long been hungry for and open to uh, Western interaction, Western products, Western goods, Western music. Uh, and for a very long time, there was a um, assumption that was you know, regularly mentioned in Washington that you know, Tehran was the most pro-American street of all of the Middle Eastern streets that existed. Um, and this, I think, is something that Iranian leaders were very conscious of, uh, knowing very well that their population and particularly their young population at the time was seeking greater uh, interaction uh, internationally um, and greater access uh, to uh, soft, the soft power influences uh, that the United States uh, projected. Um, so I think this is a huge feature um, that uh, very much pervades the mindset of the Iranian leadership. And I wanted to sort of broaden um, this topic and apply it to some of the research that um, I have been engaged in, which uh, has looked at uh, the Iranian deep state, which takes a, a sort of view that uh, within the Iranian leadership, there is a uh, uh, intricate uh, structure um, behind the scenes that goes beyond the individual personality of uh, the Supreme Leader and the individual um, institution of the IRGC, which is oftentimes referred to as the dominant um, institutional apparatus that controls not only the Iranian economy, but the security establishment and Iran's foreign policy, thereby a principal and key decision maker, but rather um, uh, present more of an intricate security intelligence and economic superstructure uh, to understand um, uh, the Iranian uh, system and how this system um, itself uh, is self uh, is directed to pre preserve itself above all um, and uh, has a particularly paranoid view of uh, the world um, very much sees uh, the soft war as a as a sort of vehicle uh, of the West to unseat and undermine the Islamic Republic. And the objective of the deep state um, is to produce um, and, and to protect the nature, the vision and the security of the Islamic Republic of Iran. Um, and this deep state uh, includes, of course, the Supreme Leader. Uh, the IRGC is a very important critical entity as is um, the IRGC's intelligence institutions, the army, the Basij, the judiciary, and Iranian uh, conglomerates um, and uh, bunyads, parasitical entities are equally part of, of this entity. And um, this group um, maintains power um, through a monopoly of not just the security establishment, but of Iran's economic resources. Um, and uh, ultimately, the goal is to protect the survival of uh, the Islamic Republic, but 
within the Islamic Republic, uh, they are also very much directed to um, preserving their relevance and, and preventing their own redundancy, knowing very well that within the system, um, and particularly at the popular level, um, there has been very clear uh, opposition to uh, the, the role of the Supreme Leader, called out many times in, in protests, uh, big and small, over the past number of decades, and the role of bigger entities that are seen to be corrupt um, and monopolizing uh, political as well as economic um, resources within the country. Um, and, and this group of people, um, as uh, Amir has stated, and I'm reinforcing here, um, very suspicious of, of the West, particularly the United States, um, in the limited con direct contact that they've had with the US, um, really honing in on um, uh, you know, words and statements like all options remain on the table um, as uh, proof positive that uh, the U.S. has an agenda that seeks to undermine the Islamic Republic. And that can be done through the direct uh, military uh, threat that has always been there um, and um, apparent through various uh, U.S. administrations, but also um, even through, uh, let's say, the JCPOA uh, negotiations, which was supported by the Iranian political establishment, um, I would even say by the Iranian um, uh, deep state. But for example, when President Obama and other uh, political leaders in the United States tried to pitch the JCPOA as being transformational rather than transactional, um, it became very clear inside Iran and, uh, that um, Washington still seeks to change the nature um, if, you know, alongside the uh, policy and regional activity of the Islamic Republic. Um, and this is where, and um, as was stated by uh, Iran's um, nuclear negotiator, um, Ali Bahari Khani, uh, that Iran is, you know, not interested in moving the goalposts. They're not interested in a deal that is always going to uh, require further discussions. Um, they're looking for a transactional relationship on the JCPOA. Uh, so, um, you know, they very much are conscious that there is this broader hunger or there's broader wish that the Islamic Republic would change, transform from, you know, the famous statement of being a cause uh, to a state. Um, and uh, because of these sort of veiled threats, of course, um, which in many cases they see as, as being real, exerted through maximum pressure, exerted through sanctions, exerted through the support of the Iranian diaspora, funding opposition groups, um, and of course, um, uh, uh, surrounding Iran in the neighborhood, um, this sort of adds to that paranoia and thinking, uh, which again, um, from their perspective, uh, um, very much supports uh, the worldview uh, that uh, the soft war is very real and, and um, ultimately is, is designed to perhaps um, alter these policies and, and remove these individuals um, from uh, places of, of control. Um, so in this context, um, understanding this worldview remains hugely critical. Um, critical because uh, the people uh, who have, um, who are key decision makers in control of Iranian military resources, as well as economic resources, share this sort of unified perception uh, that uh, Western countries, but particularly the United States, continue to have this um, a objective uh, directed towards unseating the Islamic Republic. Uh, this doesn't mean that transactional agreements um, between Tehran and Washington um, are not possible. They are very much possible, um, but they will be done, I think, in incremental bases, um, as we are seeing uh, with the, the negotiations that are currently underway in Vienna. If an, if an agreement is reached, it will be done um, on a very narrow basis and, and time will be needed um, and trust will be uh, sort of uh, this trust and verification process uh, will, will really need uh, uh, to be um, invested in uh, for a broader uh, relationship um, uh, to develop. And this would require, I think, Washington and sort of European countries also more broadly um, to shift away from thinking that they can transform the Islamic Republic. Um, I'm of the mindset and have long been of the mindset the only, the, the only sort of pathway to, to transformation uh, can really come from within and maximum pressure 
and containment and strangling of the Islamic Republic doesn't allow for that transformation to take place. In fact, as we have seen, um, as a consequence of maximum pressure, we have uh, a very formal monopoly of uh, power uh, at, at the elected level and at the unelected level uh, by, uh, the, by conservative politicians, not necessarily completely ideolo ideologically aligned conservative politicians, but there is uh, a factional um, control that we have not witnessed for uh, well over a decade in Iran, and, and that should be alarming um, as well. Um, so what should we do going forward? I think that, uh, you know, pursuing transactional policies uh, and understanding that worldview on both sides um, it is hugely, um, it, it, is, it would be a huge uh, shift in approach to dealing with the Islamic Republic. It doesn't mean that it requires necessarily recognition or pandering uh, to this worldview, um, but acknowledging that there are limits uh, to change the mindset and the ideology um, and, and giving space um, to uh, uh, Iranian people, uh, civic groups um, from within who have been stifled as a result of um, uh, this misreading of uh, the Islamic Republic, uh, of a chance to uh, redevelop, reforge bonds, um, and uh, um, push uh, their demands uh, from, uh, from a domestic standpoint rather than an international one. I'm gonna stop here and uh, look forward to the discussion and questions, thank you. Great, thank you very much. So uh, first question, uh, a two-part question. So you both described the um, possibilities of an agreement between the United States and the West generally and Iran as, as uh, the Islamic Republic of Iran as being a transactional relationship. Well, what's in it for each side? I mean, frankly, what is Khamenei gonna get out of a transactional relationship with somebody who's determined to overthrow him? And for that matter, what are what's the West going to get out of a transactional relationship with somebody who's implacably hostile to them? So why should the two sides agree to a transactional uh, um, relationship here? Amir, would you, would you like to go first? Uh, thank you, thank you. That's uh, that's a good question. As uh, to the first part of the question for what what Supreme Leader Khamenei wants in a transactional relationship, I think the JCPOA or the nuclear side, we should talk about that uh, for obvious reasons. Uh, he, for him, the most important thing, uh, that the most important outcome that he wants from him is the removal of oil sanctions and from the banking sanctions. So these would uh, sort of allow, uh, allow the Islamic Republic to do business uh, in other areas that face that otherwise he would not be able to do because of secondary sanctions. And uh, there was a series of interviews. This was last year, almost uh, February last year that his closest advisors gave on his website about what the Islamic Republic wants from negotiations. And they uh, really emphasized this point, which was in a way saying that this is what the Supreme Leader wants. Uh, and for it's difficult for me to say what the United States can get out of it because the outcome, uh, obviously, the 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 best outcome would be the would be sort of we uh, have a sort of nuclear deal that doesn't prevent that that is based on the assumption that whether if it's five years from now or ten years from now, it's not based on the assumption that that the nuclear deal can uh, and the opening to the West can transform the Islamic Republic because that's not going to happen because then, uh, uh, then because that's the question, because that's the way that the President Obama and his team uh, try to sell the public that this, uh, because that the, that the reason that this deal was good was uh, even though the, some of the key nuclear provisions would sunset and expire down the line in a couple of years where that this wouldn't matter because then the, then the state, then the regime would be more moderate. So uh, for the United States, uh, the outcome, whatever their decision should be to get out of this is, uh, is a deal that, uh, that would still be okay even if we have a hard line when we have another hardline supreme leader in charge. Um, 
and they should also something to assume that whatever the outcome of the deal is, that should also assume that effective sanction that they will not that that American policymakers should no longer be able to exercise key effective sanctions, which has been uh, which has been one of the ways that Washington has been able to exert financial pressure on the Islamic Republic to get to a deal. So then that once that happens, uh, then that opens up. Uh, I don't want to go too much into depth, but now because that goes outside the scope of this particular question, but should sort of keep those in mind that based on the assumption that once whatever, if a deal happens when this one, that the Islamic Republic, the, it, that the Supreme Leader doesn't see a reason to reach another follow on deal that would strengthen the agreement because what he wants is the removal of oil and banking sanctions and, and anything extra that the United States would be able to offer, he's not interested. Salam? Just briefly, I would say um, you're right to question, uh, but a, a transactional deal here is only related to the nuclear issue. We're not talking about a transactional broader relationship. That is nothing, uh, that is not in the cards, and that is uh, not what uh, even Ali Khamenei would seek. Uh, he is deeply um, suspicious of the United States, its intentions. If he feels like he's been you know, burnt not just once, twice, First, uh, you know, during the 2001 Afghan war where the Iranians uh, cooperated with the U.S. and, um, you know, the interpretation in Iran was that cooperation uh, was not well received because then Iran, of course, was put in the axis of evil. And of course, there are reasons why it was put into the axis of, uh, axis of evil. But this is the thinking in Tehran. So we're just trying to understand this mindset. Um, and secondly, of course, the JCPOA, again, pursued um, out of necessity pursued uh, for domestic um, economic uh, purposes, but I think also to achieve um, an indigenous uh, nuclear program as well. Um, and, uh, you know, Khamenei did so begrudgingly, went along with the negotiations, feeling quite uh, skeptical that uh, Western countries and particularly the United States would live up to the agreement. And I think the U.S. withdrawal very much confirmed his, uh, his um impressions of the United States and that it cannot be trusted vis-a-vis -vis Iran. Um, so it, this is transactionalism on this very small but critical issue um, uh, of the JCPOA, um, where it would be, you know, sanctions relief and a sustainable JCPOA above everything um, in exchange for a reversal and rolling back and, and containment of Iran's nuclear program. Nothing more, uh, nothing less. Uh, I know that less for less is, of course, being discussed in certain circles, but that's what's on the table right now. And that's what's in his interest. He is an aging man and he has a, uh, domestic issues that he actually has to get to on his agenda. But um, the economic uh, survivability of the regime is currently in jeopardy uh, because of the sanctions regime in place. And in order to address, uh, I think, his bolder uh, domestic agenda, um, an, an agreement would be useful. It's he will can probably survive without it, but it would be useful. Great. So you mentioned that the regime has not been in Iran has not been quiet about what it wants, and that its principal demands have been about uh, ending sanctions. Well, doesn't that show that really the Iran's leaders don't care that much about uh, all this soft war stuff? If they're not making any demands about the end of the soft war stuff, uh, doesn't that indicate that that's not really their concern, that their concern is a much more practical ending of, of uh, sanctions? Uh, that, that's, a, that's an interesting question, guys. And there is a sort of, there's a comma. I think the way that I would frame it is that uh, removing sanctions would be in the expediency the, the, of the state and expediency or maslahat is one of the guiding principles of the Islamic Republic that that Supreme that former Supreme Leader Khomeini established for that. So there is a sense of practicality and pragmatism, but that is deeply rooted in uh, certain uh, certain beliefs and ideologies. So, Soft war, uh, even, is 
if they were to remove software today and saying we made that up or the U.S. has no longer interested in, then that in turn removes a lot of uh, for followers and for supporters the sort of uh, threat and state of emergency that 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 they are in with regards to American with regards to so-called pernicious American influence in Iran uh, that uh, that they seek to undermine that they seek to undermine Iranians belief that so this sort of ends up unraveling a lot of the justifications and the reasons for that and for the existing policies in play that they are determined uh, to keep so they've uh, they're they're able to navigate through both of them and I think it's very essential for them to maintain this uh, soft war view to maintain solidarity and support among military security forces and their core support base and to explain the world to them in the terms that uh, it makes sense to them to continue supporting the Islamic Republic. Just briefly to add to that, um, the soft war really uh, justifies a domestic crackdown, uh, controlling dissent, um, uh, which we, you know, continue to see as as protests sort of wax and wane throughout the country. Um, it, it is it, it is useful that there is a soft war uh, for the Islamic Republic, and I think um, Amir uh, was saying that. So uh, let me reinforce: there's a utility to the soft war. It's a soft war that Tehran definitely thinks it can manage, um, and it's the soft war that Tehran itself invests in for domestic consumption, um, but also uh, the IRGC. Um, has uh, developed its own sort of propaganda and, and tools um, that are, are useful and we've seen sort of play out within the Iranian film industry, publications industry, in order to keep um, uh, this ideology um, and, and this worldview alive. Um, and, and this is of course critical as there's you know growing cleavages and distance between uh, the leadership and, um, uh, and ordinary people. So you mentioned Iran's hostile actions towards uh, towards Israel, and uh, you seem to be suggesting that there's not much the United States can do about that in these negotiations, and that, frankly, um, well, that's going to continue to be the case. So should the United States simply ignore in these negotiations the um, hostile statements and hostile actions that Iran has been making towards Israel? Uh, should should definitely not ignore, uh, should, but should keep in mind, I think, to sort of decouple the nuclear negotiations from, uh, from the desire and some, some of the suggestions that uh, the JCPOA plus could be built upon regional negotiations and for missiles, the U.S. should absolutely support its uh, the allies in the region. Uh, and uh, just to just to mention to the allies that look like this is going to be a transactional topic about this particular thing and should explore other avenues uh, to make sure that uh, prevent hopefully another third Lebanon war, but also keep in mind that uh, it's not just statements that the Islamic official Republic, Islamic Republic officials are making about Israel. There's the posturing. They've uh, put a lot of missiles in southern Lebanon, not so much, also for reasons of deterrence. Uh, but there's also uh, sort of to get into that that there is that they are guided by this belief that, uh, and the Supreme Leader has said this before, uh, and he has expanded on it that the way that they want to destroy Israel is to surround it. Uh, create security threats, whether that would be in Gaza, that would be in southern Lebanon. There was a goal to turn Syria into another front for Israel, but that has that has uh, that hasn't been as uh, successful uh, recently because of Israeli airstrikes and operations. There, there's been uh, some uh, some suggestions and statement that the Houthis in Yemen, who are backed by the IRGC, that some of the ballistic missile technology that the Islamic Republic has provided to them could 
uh, be used to launch towards uh, Israel, especially the southern part. So that's another front and enemy you need to look at. So that's not just statement and a matter of ideology. They're very serious and the way they see they can uh, to destroy Israel was to, is to surround it with these security threats create sort of a state of emergency in Israel and over the long run eroded and essentially uh, lead to a situation the way that they see it is that Israelis, a lot of Israelis will start to leave because uh, life becomes unbearable. At least this is the way that they see it. Uh, that's probably not going to happen. So it is a matter of policy goals and it is a matter of ideology. You just have to think about other avenues to what to do about that, I think it would be best to decouple that from the nuclear talks. Uh, categorically, no. I think that the United States um, must continue uh, to pressure Iran um, on, on the issue of Israel and more broadly, of course, Iran's uh, regional um, activities beyond its borders and its proliferation of le lethal aid, which is hugely destabilizing uh, to the region. Uh, but I do think that the approach has to be an incremental one. Um, obviously, uh, Israel itself um, and Israeli political leaders, despite a, a bit of mixed messaging um, over the past few weeks, I think have made it abundantly clear that a deal is better than no deal. So a hierarchy of asks um, uh, should be presented. And I think um, uh, managing uh, to contain the JCPOA should be a, a, a first priority. Um, and then from there, uh, the process should be broadened. And, and while Iran has said no uh, in the current context to broadening, I don't think that that's off the table. Um, I think that there can be um, a sort of structure or regional uh, discussion uh, that can be um, built and managed um, that uh, finds, again, a transactional uh, red lines and, and exchanges uh, between Iran and uh, its neighbors um, to uh, stabilize the region and manage regional tensions uh, in a bit more of a balanced way, particularly as regional states remain acutely concerned. And of course, they've been acutely concerned for a long time now um, about the role and presence of the United States in the region as a external security guarantor. So there are interests. Um, there are, of course, opportunities right now underway with greater regional openings among a variety of different states from the UAE to Turkey, Turkey to Egypt, Iran and Saudi Arabia. But that sort of environment very much uh, uh, requires uh, support and encouragement um, in order uh, to facilitate, again, transactional dialogue um, on um, regional stability. This question, does anyone in Iran think that if it moderated its foreign interventions and threats, then foreign powers would stop trying to undermine or uh, constrain its regime? I'm oh, sorry, would you want to repeat that question again? You kind of sure. Does anyone in Iran think that if Tehran moderated its foreign interventions and threats, then foreign powers would stop trying to undermine or constrain the Islamic Republic? Yes, uh, there is a view, not just uh, among Islamists, but there's also, we've seen among nationalists who have expressed support for the Islamic Republic's foreign intervention, the war in Syria, expansion of its influence abroad for a matter of that this expands Iranian Persian influence in the region, uh, whether they sort of see that or sort of how much they buy into some of the Islamic Republic's propaganda that uh, this is a sort of restoration to an extent of the power of ancient Persian empire. So there is, and that cuts across uh, the political spectrum uh, that there are people who believe that this is necessary to sort of fight them over there as opposed to fighting them at home. I would just quickly add, yes, there are um, uh, members of the political establishment who um, believe that uh, resolution of uh, Iran's portfolio 
um, of uh, issues uh, with uh, the United States or, or European countries um, would lead to uh, greater stability and greater international integration. Those officials are oftentimes referred to as pragmatists, centrists, and reformists um, that are currently out of office. And many um, in Western countries um, have oftentimes assumed that these individuals, uh, rightly or wrongly so, did not have the authority or the ability uh, to make um, uh, these shifts in Iran's foreign policy. So there is, a, I think, a base um, that, that believes that integration is the way to protect the Islamic Republic and moderation is the way to uh, protect the Islamic Republic. Um, but that uh, that base um, and that community is definitely out of office and, and, and hugely uh, marginalized right now. And of course, um, in the past, uh, perhaps hasn't had the ability, um, independence um, in order to uh, push through uh, huge reforms on the foreign policy front. If I may add something, uh, there was an interesting anecdote that I read earlier. This was in Kahan newspaper, which is uh, the best way to describe it, which would be the on again, off again, unofficial mouthpiece of the Supreme Leader. I had an interview with the spouse of an Iranian, of an RGC fighter who was killed in Syria. She said that they no longer uh, mentioned outside to other people that the husband was killed in Syria because that's how deeply unpopular it has become. So while there's that belief that the Islamic Republic's influence uh, abroad that has people who support that, uh, some across the spectrum, uh, these regional interventions uh, the overall, if you could factor in the population, they are deeply unpopular and those are blamed for uh, Iran's isolation uh, internationally and in the region. So from your description of the uh, view that the United States is out to overthrow uh, Iran's Islamic Republic, uh, one could get the impression that it doesn't make much difference if U.S. political leaders stand up there and say, yeah, we're all in favor of regime change. That's right. That's what we're going to do. We're going to promote it. Uh, so do you think that, in fact, that uh, when U.S. political leaders talk about the promotion of regime change, what impact does that have on these transactional negotiations with Iran? How much complication does that create? for the ability to reach a transactional agreement with, with Iran? Uh, I think the best way to describe it would be that there is, if we were to say that there is a baseline that Islamic Republic leaders believe uh, in terms of Washington being got for perennial regime change, uh, then that could take the form of what former president Obama was saying in their view to support other it's inside the regime, which we've spoken about. And when American officials uh, make statements that, uh, or would make statements that, uh, that the US is out for regime change in, in Iran as a matter of policy, that certainly increases uh, the threat perception and that uh, sort of for particular agreements, uh, if, if we want to reach that, that does complicate uh, reach an agreement on their end to an extent because then it would uh, want to harden the position because then you wouldn't want that uh, obviously to go easily with some, at least the way that they want to, to justify to their followers that they are not going to stand for it. But uh, so I think there's that interplay, but there's nothing American officials can say that would absolutely remove the threat perception that the U.S. is out for regime change. That's just not going to happen. And there's something to point to that is that if conditions dictate uh, when they have dictated, so the Islamic, official, Islamic Republic officials have agreed to struck deals with their mortal enemy. And one clear example would be uh, the Ba'athist uh, Saddam Hussein uh, toward the, to end the Iran-Iraq war, which he called, which Ayatollah Khomeini called, was drinking the poison chalice because that was that was just what the conditions dictated. So the so there's something to keep that in mind. I think. 
just quickly, I, I think this would require a consistent policy shift um, from the uh, from all both sides of the American political establishment. Um, and I think that what the Islamic Republic has witnessed or uh, what has sort of um, calcified uh, this worldview is uh, also as a result of, of policy swings in the United States. Um, and I, it, you know, it requires a consistent policy and perhaps a, a change of generational leadership in order to alter this mindset. So how much is this mindset uh, the product of Ali Khamenei and how broadly based in it is, is this in the, uh, in the Iranian elite? What should we expect after Khamenei leaves the scene? He's, after all, not a young man. Uh, mm -hmm. Do you think that there's a possibility that, or what is the possibility uh, that these, this attitude will change with a new generation of leadership? I think there's very little possibility of that of that changing the sense uh, Supreme Leader Ali Khamenei has and the older generation of the revolution, the way that they have prioritized is grooming uh, officials and a younger generation who, who at the very least ascribe to certain parameters in their worldview. And uh, Khamenei is very aware that uh, he doesn't want a particular situation for whomever the next supreme leader would be. Would uh, even even the idea of detente is uh, is uh, something that he considered to uh, be something that would be undesirable. Uh, or, for example, even even let's say a situation like how it was with America and the Soviet Union, where there were diplomatic open channels, there was American embassy over there and such, but even having an American embassy, that is such a taboo because in his worldview, that begins a sort of domino effect of that starting from there and ending up in Iran, in the Islamic Republic being overthrown or fundamentally changing his worldview. And he wants to ensure that whoever comes next, that the next generation of leaders ascribe to his particular worldview. And from what we have seen, uh, the next generation, uh, they, at least the people who are being groomed uh, up over there, they are of that mindset, even though now we see there are people who didn't experience the revolution or, were, or weren't even around for the Iran-Iraq war or were too young to remember, but there are now, but there have been new avenues to sort of educate and school them in the ideology. One would be the Syrian war, where a new generation of IRGC officers from the, from the junior program, they went to fight there in Iraq and Syria. And uh, that was a sort of to uh, bring them in and to make sure that they pass those tests over a long period of time. <clears throat> Um, I would definitely say that um, this, uh, the Islamic Republic that has been around now for four decades is uh, less, you know, we know it's been less interactive with the world. Uh, uh, the young people today who have grown up inside Iran are a product of Iran's own bureaucracy and own academic system, and thereby um, it, more uh, directly influenced by uh, the ideology and the thinking inside Iran. Um, this, uh, of course, um, uh, doesn't mean that there is not a plurality of, of thought, but um, in general, uh, you know, we can assume that there is much more of a uniformity. Um, uh, we know we have seen the Islamic Re Republic move away maybe from its I uh, Islamic core um, through these years and these decades. Um, and the uh, political establishment, the deep state is uh, very conscious of that. Um, but um, the, uh, the, the shift um, is to a nationalist uh, discourse and, and one that is very much hinged on Iranian pride and frustration uh, with uh, Iran's uh, political situation in the region, its economic situation at home. Um, it brings up a sort of myriad of intersectional issues that are, um, so 
uh, this up and coming generation, uh, which uh, will extend no, no, um, no less to uh, succession at the top, I think is going to be influenced from uh, the thinking uh, inside Iran and less from the thinking outside Iran. It doesn't mean that um, a new supreme leader can't take Iran in a different trajectory. I think we should very much expect whoever comes next to try to, over time, leave its his own imprint on the political establishment and, and the system. Um, but uh, this is uh, going to be an, uh, a product of, of the Islamic Republic and a product of uh, frustration and isolation and this paranoid uh, worldview. Um, so whoever comes up and this new generation that come up, um, I think are embedded with this thinking. So it will be, uh, will require greater international integration and interaction. Um, and of course, trust um, in Iran's international relationships um, for this mindset to change. And I think this is why, of course, Iran is also orienting itself and has been for a while um, towards China. Uh, it sees uh, China as um, a model. Uh, it, it, it is attracted to the fact that China doesn't intervene in uh, domestic affairs. Um, it feels comfortable in that relationship. Um, so, uh, you know, that it also has affected the worldview and the thinking of uh, uh, this conservative uh, political establishment. Thank you. Well, and thanks to both of our speakers. And uh, as uh, the Islamic Republic evolves and as that new leadership takes power, we will continue to watch the situation closely. And uh, I suspect that there will be much for us to talk about. And I'm sorry to say, I'm afraid that there will still continue to be much tension uh, between uh, Iran and the United States. But uh, anyway, thank you very much for joining us. And I, I recommend to all those who are listening to take a look at uh, Amir's study and it's uh, a rich in analysis and includes many points we did not have an opportunity to get into today. So once again, thanks everybody for listening.